welcome to The Kill Count, where we tally up the victims in all our favorite horror movies. I'm James A. Janice, and you know how sometimes movies get re-released with special editions? Well, that's what you're getting today, because once again, we are looking at Freddy vs. Jason, both the 8th Nightmare on Elm Street and the 11th Friday the 13th, released in 2003, 10 years after the teaser we got at the end of Jason Goes to Hell. As with most special edition re-releases, a lot of what you're about to see was in the original release of this video. But I wanted to record a new updated version, now that I know a lot more about Freddy, and also now that I'm way better at making videos. This movie's still a mixed bag for me, with its superficial characters and the double hitter of bad special effects, talking about the choppy slow motion and making everyone fly through the air when they get hit by something. But if you're just watching this to see Freddy and Jason beat the shit out of each other, you won't be disappointed. There's lots of it and it's graphic as hell. This crossover was a huge deal for the genre. Putting these two horror icons together was something being talked about since the 80s, and the studios went through dozens of screenplays trying to figure out the best way to do it. The premise they settled on is one in which the kids in Springwood have forgotten about Freddy, leaving him powerless and unable to visit them during their Betty by time. So Freddy manipulates Jason to come back from hell and scare the kids into thinking Freddy's back, so they'll start dreaming about him again and bring him back to power. Maybe that's not as cool as them competing for Satan's respect by seeing how many people each one could kill, or whatever else those older scripts had. But you know what? It works well enough and delivers lots of kills. So let's get to them. The movie begins with Freddy bitching about getting burned to death by the parents of all the little kids he's murdered. Yeah, well, that's what happens, man. Maybe don't kill kids. I'm actually gonna count this little girl in the beginning as an off-screen death for Freddy. Since he approaches her, she screams, and then he's, uh, licking the picture of her and putting it in a scrapbook. Calm down there, Freddy. This isn't the remake just yet. There's a fun montage of stuff from the Elm Street movies, but I notice they're almost all from the first three, aka the good ones. Freddy says he searched through hell for someone to kill for him until he got a really promising application by a Mr. Jason Voorhees. Through Jason's mask, we transport to what appears to be Crystal Lake. How do we know it's Crystal Lake? Well, this Heather chick is doing a midnight solo skinny dip. That's usually a good indication. She eventually winds up in the woods with Jason behind her, and he impales her against a tree with his trusty machete. I'm still putting this one on the list, even though Heather's not actually real, as revealed when she pops her head up and morphs into a bunch of different people, which is weird. Pamela Voorhees shows up and tells Jason to wake up and get back to killing. Too bad for Jason, she's actually Freddy in disguise. And too bad for us, it's not actually Betsy Palmer. They asked her to do it, but she was done with this shit by then. Jason's heart starts beating, and he wakes up his sleepy head, puts on some clothes, and shakes up his dirt bed, and wanders off into the woods so he can get killing again. The movie starts properly with a title card and some new metal courtesy of Spineshank. And you know what? It's not that dreadful. It's kind of grown on me. It's time to meet our protagonist, who happens to live at the best goddamn house ever built. You know I mean that dope Dutch colonial, the Elm Street house. Our final girl is Lori. That's right, Lori, not Laura. And her buddies are Kia and Gib. They're all boring and superficial. Do you guys think I should get a nose job? And it's one of the worst parts about this movie. These characters just plain suck, and it's a bummer having to watch them for 90 minutes. The worst of them all is Trey, a guy who's a major dick to his girlfriend. Whoa, babe. Tell you about kissing me after you smoked, huh? Babe. Make me ask you twice, okay? Babe. You know I don't like to be touched that much, okay? Thankfully, he's the first to get got. After he cracks open a cold post-coital beer, Jason shows up and stabs him in the back a whole bunch of times. Like, over and over and over. Before folding him up in the bed like a human futon. Babe, you know I can only fall asleep when I'm shaped like a V, okay? For whatever reason, Jason leaves without killing the other kids, so they alert the police, who try to cover up what they think is the return of Freddy Krueger. It's gotta be Freddy Krueger. Hey, don't even say that son of a bitch's name out loud. Yep, motherfuckers act like they forgot about Fred, but Lori overhears the name, and after talking to Officer Stubbs, that one dude from Scary Movie, she falls asleep at the police station right after remembering Freddy's name. This triggers a fun little creepy dream sequence with disappearing bloody footprints, some missing kid posters on loan from the Hogwarts PD, and this super creepy little girl. It culminates in a reunion performance by the Jump Rope Girls, and they know what the crowd came to hear. On to more victims, like Trey's friend Blake, who's also a total douche of a human being. You know about Feng Shui? And whose actor recently graduated from the Nicolas Cage Academy of Acting. My best friend was just killed, Dad! So how about giving me some fucking space? He falls asleep on his porch and Freddy shows up to kill him, but it turns out Kruger is still too impotent to do the job himself. I swear this never happens to me, bitch. Freddy friggin' talks directly to the audience as he lets them know that he'll let Jason have some fun. Blake wakes up unharmed and finds his father decapitated by Jason. Aw, but if his Alex Jones looking dad had survived, he could have spread conspiracies about all these kids getting killed. Cause that's what Alex Jones does, he's a bad man. Blake barely has time to think about what he'll do with all that inherited Infowars money before Jason appears behind him and uses his machete to slash Blake to death off screen. Sure, it's an off screen death, but at least we get to see the hilarity of Blake using his father's head as a shield. Next up on our crossover itinerary is Weston Hills, the infamous psych ward that served as the setting for everyone's favorite nightmare sequel. Hanging out there is Lori's ex Will and his buddy Mark. 
are. Two pretty likable characters, since Will is played by John Ritter's son, and Mark's just a lot of fun to watch. Yeah, you take that pill, bro. They escape the hospital, and then we're subjected to like 20 minutes of just watching these crappy characters lead their crappy lives. Got your nose! We're here for Freddy vs. Jason, not Freddy vs. Kelly Rowland. Also, like, shouldn't her nose be gone in real life after that? Mark tries to convince Will that Freddy is real and was responsible for his brother's apparent suicide. He also accidentally spreads the good word of Freddy Krueger to the entire high school, like a big dumb Fred Evangelist. That night, everyone heads to a crazy cornfield rager. You know, standard high school party setting. The resident nerd Linderman shows up, uninvited, and gets hazed by this Bobby Moynihan looking guy named Shaq. But don't feel too bad for Linderman, dude's even more pretentious than I was in high school. You tear me down to make yourself feel better because you really hate yourself, which is kind of pathetic when you actually stop and think about it, assuming of course you can think of all that makeup weighing down your head. Okay, actually, that does sound like something I would have said in high school verbatim. Damn. Don't be a Linderman, or like a high school me. Gib ends up passing out, and during her dream, wanders into a boiler room, because Freddy just likes to do his work where he's the most comfortable, okay? He stalks her around, doing some fun callbacks to classic nightmare moments, but before he can kill her himself, she erupts from a real-life wound, spitting blood in Freddy's face and disappearing from his dream world. Damn, Fred, you just got your kill stolen, because turns out Jason wants the party too, so he impaled Gib to the ground with a pipe. In the process, he also kills this ridiculous-looking glow stick guy, who was straight up out to to rape Gib while she was passed out. But as we saw in Jason Takes Manhattan, Mr. Voorhees don't take kindly to sexual assaulters, so he murders the would-be rapist with that big old rusty pipe. Fuck that guy. See you later. Jason emerges from the corn stalks like an oversized child of the corn and twists this jock guy's head around in a gross display of early 2000s CG. It's a real bad effect, and that dude is probably just standing there wearing his jacket backwards as he falls down. Shaq lights Jason on fire with some Navy strength gin, which is just a joke, y'all. Shaq was probably just drinking shitty jungle juice. Whatever was in that cup, it definitely wasn't flammable enough to cause this awesome fire stunt, but that's okay. However we can get this overhead shot of flaming Jason in a cornfield is fine by me. Shaq runs away in that nasty low frame rate slow motion before Jason's finally like, BOOM! Throws his blade in the air for a stab! It goes through Shaq's body, god damn! I swear, I'm just telling you the facts of how Jason killed Shaq. Fire Jason joins the party and goes on a killing spree, but too bad all the kills are really fast machete swipes, so they're not all that satisfied. Especially this third one, look at this. Jason clearly misses with his swipe, but then the guy suddenly has a wound in the middle of his body, spraying blood all over the place. There are six kills here, which yes, are kills 10 through 15. Count this shit on your fingers, people, it's not that hard. Will drives Lori home, where she argues with her dad about a shoehorned in subplot that's just there to give Freddy a little extra purpose in this movie. Apparently her mom died a bit ago, and Will says that her dad's the one who did it, since he saw him stabbing her with a knife. Again, this whole thing is really forced. We don't need Freddy and Lori to have some kind of past connection. Lori runs off with Will to Mark's house, where Mark is having a nightmare about his brother's suicide. Yo, you didn't tell me your brother was Scott Farkas, Mark. He has yellow eyes, so help me God, yellow eyes! Freddy lights Mark on fire just as Will and Lori show up at his window, so they get ringside tickets to Freddy killing Mark with an invisible face slash. Just to be sure he doesn't get another kill stolen, Freddy brands Mark like a cattle to let everyone know whose back that is now. The kids all get together with Stubbs to hatch a plan against Freddy and Jason, and this is where the movie completely loses itself. It's bad enough we have to spend more time with these shitty characters, including this dude Freeberg, who's a straight ripoff of Jay from the View Askew universe. And screw that clown. I mean, what kind of a pussy comes after you in your dreams, anyway? Now that, that big ass motherfucker back at the corner. Field. Come here, who the fuck that was. He'll fuck anything that moves! But even worse is the real clunky exposition. Wait a minute. Freddy died by fire, Jason by water. How can we use that? We should concentrate on Jason first. But I, I thought we decided that Freddy was the one pulling the string. Shouldn't we go after him first? This sounds like the screenwriters working the story out aloud. Lori nods off and Freddy attacks her. And when the gang wakes her up, they discover that classic Elm Street fact that you can pull stuff from the dream world into the real world, like Freddy's ear. They finally settle on a plan to go get Hypnocell, everyone's favorite dream suppressant from the psych ward. They break in and the only security guard there ends up being unable to stop them, since he's got a bigger problem on his hands when and Jason's knock knock knocking at the door. The guard ends up flattened beneath the door, but sadly the flattening happens off screen. Also sad is the CG blood, which looks terrible, but was probably cheaper, and that's probably why it's all over this movie. You know what's also CG and terrible? This fucking Freddy Caterpillar that shows up and tokes down with Freebird. Look, I'm down like Alice when it comes to getting high with bugs, but Freebird fucks up and falls asleep, having a terrible nightmare before getting possessed by Toki the Caterpillar. Then he spills all the drugs down the sink like a total narc. Not cool, bro. Jason shows up and smashes this electrical panel thing with his machete enabling him to grab onto Stubbs and electrocute him in turn. He ends the kill with a classic Jason maneuver, smashing Stubbs into the panel and taking out the power of the building at the same time. Then the Freddy-possessed Freeberg tries to stop Jason with a bunch of tranquilizers. He gets him in, but then Jason cuts Freeberg in half with his machete. I mean, in the end, it did knock Jason out, so I guess the plan was a success from Freddy's point of view, just not from Freeberg's, because, you know, he's laying there cut in half. Snoochie boochies. With Jason unconscious, he finds Freddy in Dreamland, and they have a Mankind vs. Undertaker-style boiler room brawl. SummerSlam 96, y'all! Even though this is sort of a 
a warm-up bout, it's actually a fun fight. Since it's in a dream, Freddy has the upper hand. He even plays Jason like a pinball machine at one point. But it ends in a bizarre fashion, with Freddy figuring out that Jason's afraid of water. Yeah, you know, Jason's well-known aquaphobia, which is why he's never gone in the water once during any of the 10 Friday films that came before this. Not a single goddamn time. Then Jason turns back into a weird little naked boy, and Freddy jams his finger knife in his brain, which causes us to go inside his mind, even though we were already kind of there since we were in his dreams. So what are these, memories? I don't fucking know, man. All I know is that the kids are driving Jason's body to Crystal Lake, which is in New Jersey, eight hours away from Springwood, Ohio. Whatever, just roll with it. They put Lori under so she can find Freddy, grab him, and bring him out to the real world. She visits a dream world that you can tell is a dream because of the choppy slow motion. Oh, what? They've been using that effect this entire movie regardless of reality? Cool. She watches as kid Jason gets teased by other campers who push him into the lake, where Freddy takes over and starts to drown him. That affects real world Jason, so Kia reluctantly goes to give him mouth to mouth. But then he wakes up and the whole thing goes to hell, with the van crashing and Jason's body flying out of it. This wakes him up and removes him from the dream world, so Freddy attacks Lori instead and then shows her a flash back or something of when he killed her mom. Yep, turns out Will saw her dad just trying to kill Freddy, I guess. The important thing here is that Freddy gets another kill on the count, because damn is Jason kicking his ass in that department. Yeah, we know, Freddy, he stole your gib kill, but that only accounts for one. Freddy gets all sexual on Lori, because that's what Freddy does, but then the plan actually works, and Lori pulls him into the real world, where he has a fight with Jason inside a flaming building, which is what Freddy's afraid of, remember? Freddy died by fire, Jason by water, how can we use that? This is another fun little brawl, the first part of the gigantic finale. Highlights include Jason sweeping Freddy across a bunch of windows and eventually throwing him to high heavens with that stupid flying effect that's all over this movie. During the fight, Linderman also gets slammed against the wall and impaled with a metal bracket thing, so while Freddy and Jason duke it out, Kia helps Linderman sit against a tree. She says she'll be back for him later, but it's too late, Kia. Dude bleeds out and dies. Out of all the Nightmare and Freddy films, is this the only kill where someone's just kind of left on their own to expire? Sucks for Linderman. Kia runs back to distract Freddy away from Lori and Will, but before Freddy can up his KD with another kill for himself, Jason shows up and whacks Kia against a tree with his machete, with enough force to send her flying through the air like the sandbag in Smash Bros, but not enough to cut her in half? How dull is that blade? Freddy and Jason go at it again, this time in the film's main event. It's got a nice build to it, starting with some standard slashing and bludgeoning, and then moving on to more fun stuff. Freddy flies through the air and lands by some big air tank things that he then sends against Jason like a bunch of torpedoes. The one that lands sends Jason also flying through the air, and their fight continues at a construction site, where Jason gets a bunch of poles impaled through his body, and they both get hit by this dolly thing. Again, flying flying through the air and landing on the Crystal Lake dock. There we get the biggest and most gruesome hits of the battle. Jason slashes Freddy a bunch and causes blood to spray everywhere. Freddy slices off a few of Jason's fingers, leaving him a little nubby nub hand. And then Freddy just fucking wails on Jason with his own machete. Finally, most graphically, he jams his finger knives straight through Jason's mask. Good God! Not to be outdone, Jason manages to rip off Freddy's arm, even as Freddy gets one last big machete stab in. It's obscenely bloody, brutal stuff, and it's all a lot of fun to watch. Then Lori runs over, looking like the bus Olympic torch carrier you've ever seen, and lights the whole thing on fire. The fire hits a propane tank, and you know what happens next. Jason and Freddy fly through the air. But at least this stunt is actually real, and looks good because of it. In fact, stunt performers Douglas Chapman and Glenn Ennis were nominated for an award for this, so good on them. Lori and Will think it's all over, meaning this is obviously their first horror film, because out of the lake, ready to do just a bit more killing with that machete, comes Freddy! Haha! <laughs> you think it's Jason, but it's Freddy. That's fun. He goes to kill them with a the machete, but Jason comes from behind and impales Freddy with his own face! Finger knives, Nancy Thompson style. Then Jason just backflops into Crystal Lake, aquaphobia and all. Lori picks up the machete and gives Freddy a taste of his own one-liner medicine. Welcome to my world, bitch! then decapitates the man in the red and green sweater, giving us a nice spurt and fountain of blood, and the last time we'll ever see Robert England get killed as Freddy. Good work, Lori, you did it. Afterwards, she tosses Jason's machete into the lake as a sign of, I don't know, respect, closure, evidence disposal? It doesn't matter. She and Will limp away through the burning campgrounds, survivors of the greatest matchup in horror history. Now, you may be asking why I didn't include Jason on the kill count. Well, you stupid bastard, it's because of course he's still alive. The final shot of the film has Jason emerging slowly from the lake with his trusty machete in one hand and Freddy Freddy's head in the other, the victor of this epic showdown. Wait, did Freddy just wink at us? Too bad, Fred, I'm still counting you as dead, mostly because you put up such a poor showing in this thing. Don't believe me? Let's go with the numbers. <laughs> I counted 23 deaths in Freddy vs. Jason. Jason secured 19 of them, and Freddy only had 3, with Lori nabbing the ultimate kill of Freddy himself. Only 5 of the victims were women, meaning 18 were male, giving us a pretty imbalanced gender distribution. 
With a runtime of 97 minutes, that gives us a kill on average every 4.2 minutes. I'll still give the Golden Chainsaw for coolest kill to Trey for that folding in half trick. Even though if you look real closely, you can see his eye move while the camera trucks back. This time though, Dol Machete for lamest kill goes to Linderman, because I thought about it and realized that he just sits against a tree and dies on his own. That's lame as hell. And that's it. Released in 2003, Freddy vs. Jason made more at the box office than any entry in either franchise, so it's kinda weird we never got a sequel to it. I hope you enjoyed my special nightmare edition of this video, cause it kinda screwed up my work schedule. But we'll be back on track next week when we close out the Elm Street series with that god awful 2010 remake. Until then, I'm James A. Janice. This has been the Kill Count. Thanks a lot for watching my Kill Count on Freddy vs. Jason. I want to thank a couple of my patrons like Troy Orr and Tracy S. I also want to thank a couple of Practical Folks fans who sent me this shirt, Kaylee Coomer and Chelsea Howard. I do have a P.O. box. I'll put the address in the description. Part of the reason I did a special edition of this video was because the original version got age-restricted. Hopefully that doesn't happen again. If you've seen both versions, let me know what you think of the differences. Be good people.